Now, we are indeed fortunate that we have Dr. Chris Widga with us, who is a paleontologist, to introduce us to the deep time understanding of the arrival of the bison to the North American landscapes and the overlap between people and the animals with which they interacted at the end of the last ice age. Please welcome Dr. Widga. Okay, I'll, I'll see if I can avoid any feedback in the micro, microphones. But uh, so, yeah, thank you for having me today. This is really a fantastic symposium. It's something that I'm I've been looking forward to ever since I heard about it. Um, one of the neat things about this symposium, one of the really uh, aspects of it that, that I found really fascinating is all the different kinds of knowledge that you're going to hear about today. So, you know, from, uh, from Mr. John Eagle, from uh, Dr. Flores, you'll hear, you'll hear a number of different perspectives. All these are different kind of bodies of knowledge. Uh, we all have our expertise, and they aren't incompatible. I will say that up front. Um, you know, my, my role here is as a paleontologist, as a geologist, and an archaeologist. Uh, I've spent a long time thinking about bison, and it started kind of more recently, kind of synthesizing some of what I've, I've thought about it. But what I come from, uh, where I get my information, is basically spending, you know, head down in a square hole on very hot summer days or in dark, dusty museum drawers. This is a whole different kind of knowledge than some of the other speakers that you're going to hear from today. But like I said, it's not incompatible. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we're, we're coming up with different stories, uh, but the limitations of certainly the scientific record, the paleontological record, um, don't allow the richness of what we see from some of the oral histories or even from the documentary histories. So I'm going to kind of cover some of this today. Um, and before I get started, you know, you might be asking, you know, what does this guy from eastern Tennessee have to do about bison? What does he know about bison? It, I mean, you, you're not even, you know, you're, you're way outside of the range here. Uh, well, actually, uh, today I, I live in the shadow of Buffalo Mountain in eastern Tennessee, and so I can't get away from bison. <laughs> but uh, I, I grew up in the central Platte Valley in, in central Nebraska, and very early on, um, it was, it, it's a beautiful place, but very early on I realized that this is, this is a beautiful landscape. Uh, this is actually a restored prairie in, uh, in Hamilton County, Nebraska. Be beautiful place, but it's missing elements to that landscape. Uh, one of those missing elements is bison. Uh, of course, there's also other missing elements, like native peoples. Uh, there's missing elements uh, like other uh, plants and animals that are no longer with us. Um, but really, from a very early age, I was kind of impacted by this landscape. And, and I had a passion and a fascination with bison. Um, and this kind of kept with me. If, if, if you want to learn about bison, if you want to do research on bison, it's a cross-disciplinary uh, approach. So I ended up going into archaeology, really looking at the uh, fossil record and the archaeological record of bison, thinking about their ecology, thinking about how they interacted with that landscape as well as people and as well as other animals, thinking about the ecological aspects of this particular animal. And through the years, um, I've, unfortunately, it kind of seems like I keep moving, moving further and further east, and so uh, <laughs> I'm not following the, the way of the bison. But, uh, but moving from Nebraska to uh, Arizona to Illinois to now Tennessee, uh, everywhere I go, bison kind of follow me, and eventually I end up looking at some of these local stories and some of these local records of bison. And so I'm going to share some of those with you today. Um, first of all, I think it is very appropriate and to acknowledge that the record I'm going to be talking about and the record that I've, had, I've kind of been head down in for the last 20 years uh, it would not be here without the indigenous groups that created this record. This, the bison uh, kill sites, bison bones from archaeological sites, um, they are uh, an invaluable paleoecological record. Uh, this is one of the few ways that we can really address, we can really get at what is the impact of things like climate change on Great Plains ecosystems. We have this wonderful record. This is a, from a paper that we just published uh, earlier in the spring uh, with a postdoc from uh, Montana State, John Wendt. Um, 
and this was kind of a big data analysis. We were trying to get at what are the edges of the bison niche. And, uh, and we used 2,300 bison sites, 2,300 dated sites, dated occurrences of bison in, in, in North America. Uh, and so you can see they're everywhere. You might kind of notice that they also trickle out here into the east. We've got them in Southern California. We've got them in Arizona, places that you don't normally expect to see bison. So I, I think it's, it's very, very good to uh, acknowledge up front that this record would not be here without these indigenous groups that use them very regularly for their subsistence. Um, I, I kind of approach this record very humbly, uh, in part because science is about asking questions. And every time I come to this record with a question, I may get an answer, but on the back end, I usually have 10 more questions. And so this is something, as scientists, we, we get used to this. We get used to not knowing everything. And this is one of those reasons why these threads of different knowledges are, are very important in kind of the conversations that we can have as historians and as native peoples and as scientists. Uh, it, identifying the places where those threads cross and we can kind of construct this, this uh, combined narrative is really important. So now we'll talk about some bison. <laughs> um, so I kind of have a roadmap here. I'm gonna talk about the earliest bison and their arrival in North America. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the Ice Age communities that they were a part of. Uh, and then we're gonna dive into the last 12,000 years because there's really no hard and fast uh, chapters in this story. Uh, it's very difficult to split it up. I, I don't have a book. Uh, because scientists like me, we, we, have to, we have to take our larger narrative and slice them up into 10 or 20 page papers. Uh, and I'm not as good of a storyteller as John Eagle. So um, you're gonna see a lot of maps and graphs. And bear with me, uh, this, is, this is part of our story. So, but throughout this all, we'll also kind of really focus on the ecology of Pleistocene and Holocene bison. This is something that I think is really important, especially as we look at future climate change. So we're not only looking into the past, but we're also looking into the future. There's another common thread between all the speakers that you'll see today. Um, but then also, we have some new methods that we've been using, and then they've been kind of rewriting some of what we know about fossil bison. And so I'll also work in some of those things. Um, first, let's start at the beginning. So this is, uh, this is the first of many graphs you will see. <laughs> but this is from a paper actually um, in 2018. So it's a very recent paper. We're using new techniques of ancient DNA to get at who bison are, who are they most closely related to. And, uh, and, and this group was actually looking mostly at European bison, uh, bison bonassus. But in so doing, they were basically putting together a family tree of how bison are related to other bo bovines. Um, this family tree starts out about one and a half million years ago, and then about 1.3 million years ago, you start to see this split. Oh, thank you. Um, and you can see these red lines across here. These are interbreeding events. So these are events where we have shared genes across these different lines. And you, so you can see that this split is neither clean nor abrupt. You know, there's a lot of, of breeding back and forth between cows and bison between you know, one and a half million and about 800,000 years ago. This doesn't stop. So this is something that we know based on modern bison. We have a lot of introgression with, with uh, modern bison and cattle. Uh, this is a conservation issue. Um, but it also happened in the past. So even at 140,000 years ago, we're getting some of these, uh, this gene flow between bison populations and, and domesticated, well, not domesticated cattle, but the line that eventually becomes domesticated cattle. So these are kind of sloppy uh, taxonomic categories. E even if we say bison, bison looks like a bison, it sounds like a bison, it acts like a bison. Um, but if we're talking about it in an evolutionary perspective, well, to tell you the truth, yaks are right here. <laughs> and, and so they, it is kind of a, a, a messy uh, taxonomy. And this is both part of the fascination. Uh, it's also part of the, uh, the, uh, the, the evolutionary history. So today we're gonna talk about this line. So we're, not, we're gonna ignore cattle for now, as I have for the last 20 years, and talk about bison, especially this bison priscus or the steppe bison. So this is the first bison that uh, if we want to go to the paleontological record and we, we say, okay, what, what is really the first successful bison? Uh, it is bison priscus or the steppe bison. Steppe bison are distributed from Western Europe all the way across Siberia into North America, into Alaska and the Yukon. Uh, they're extremely 
variable, and they're really impressive. So this is a mummy uh, from central Alaska called Blue Babe. If you have a mummy, you give it a name. Uh, so this is a, a mummy step bison. This particular bison died about 30,000 years ago, and we think it probably died from uh, an American lion attack. Uh, we actually have bite marks on its snout. We've got some claw marks on its body. Um, this is, this is a, a, a really famous specimen. It gives you, you can really see what these steppe bison might have looked like. Really large horns. These are, these are very large animals. Um, but they're also variable. So here's a whole bunch of steppe bison skulls, and they're also really common. So this is a, the other thing about the bison record. is they are everywhere, and there are lots of them. And this gives us a really interesting perspective on a, a bison's eye perspective on the landscape, if we know how to ask the right questions. So we have the steppe bison, and so they're distributed, like I said, all the way from Europe. This is a weird graph, sorry, weird, weird map. You're basically, here's the North Pole in the middle. So you're looking at the top of the earth on down. And so we start, you know, we have bison all the way across uh, this whole Arctic area. And they get all the way into the Yukon in Alaska, and, 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 uh, and so this is the, the range of steppe bison. When they get in, there's two questions about how do they get into America. First, when do they get there into Alaska and the Yukon? So when do they get, when do they cross this Bering Land Bridge from Eastern Siberia into Alaska? And so that's one question. The next question is when do they get down to the lower 48? When do they get below the glaciers? And so a good way to think of this is to look at, um, you know, look at the, 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 the land bridge between Siberia and Alaska as a faucet. And so this, is a, a, uh, this particular flow of bison happens when you have bison in Siberia, so you have to have bison there first, but it also happens when sea level is lowered. And when sea level goes down, there's a land bridge that exposes right here across the Bering Sea, uh, and you can get animals crossing, you can get people crossing. Uh, and this is, this is, there, this is a highway uh, in the Pleistocene. There's, there's lots of, of, of animals and people moving back and forth. Uh, and, and so this is, a, th this is a key bottleneck. But then you have to get below these continental glaciers. And this is, this is also difficult. Uh, so you can only go down to the lower 48 when those glaciers recede. Ironically, glacial periods are when this, this uh, sea level is lower, and so this, this uh, land bridge is exposed. So glacial periods, you get a lot of the water is locked up in ice on land, and so sea levels go down, and it exposes a land bridge between the two, and bison can move back and forth across here. But because it's a glacial period, you can't get down to the lower 48 because Canada is covered by ice. And so you have to wait for interglacial periods in order for them to move down into the lower 48. So if bison can move across into Alaska and the Yukon, but they can't move down immediately into the lower 48. And this is, this is kind of the, the stratigraphic constraints on the timing of bison into North America. Um, we're gonna continue this conversation a little bit, but we're gonna to move to the fossil record. And so first, there's this question of when do bison arrive in North America, and then when do they appear south of the glaciers? There's a couple of key sites that I'll be talking about, uh, one up here in the Yukon, a couple down here further south. There's also a really fantastic record of early bison from the Great Plains. Um, you can walk down the hallway and see a really great bison latifrons, and perhaps the best bison latifrons mount that I've ever seen, flying saber-toothed cats. You need to see it if you haven't already. Um, but uh, we're gonna kind of talk about this record. First, we're gonna talk about the one from the Yukon. And this is really recent research, so Dwayne Frezzi, uh, who was originally scheduled to be here today, he would be talking a lot about this record. Uh, and a few years ago, uh, he was working on this, this very old, these are very old sediments in the Yukon and found some bison bones. And this is a bison foot bone, a bison metapodial. You're going to see lots of pictures of these because they're very distinctive fossils for bison. Uh, and so he found this bison foot bone. Not only was he able to date it to about 130,000 years old, but there was preserved DNA from it. So this is one of the key things, kind of one of the key differences uh, between uh, genetic studies from 20, 30 years ago and genetic studies from today. We're able to extract DNA from much older uh, specimens were able to extract much better DNA, much more, much longer lengths, uh, sometimes even complete mitochondrial DNA or complete nuclear genomes. So he was able to reconstruct, you know, use this as an anchor 
for a family tree of bison based on DNA. And so that's what this kind of line over here is. Uh, so this is a family tree on its side with yaks as an outgroup. Uh, but we have kind of two groups of bison that come into North America based on ancient DNA. So the first group gets here uh, 195 to 135,000 years ago based on the DNA. They're splitting off of this, this, this Siberian bison population. And we can estimate that time based on um, you know, the, the, uh, the mutation rate of the DNA itself. Um, but then you also have a second immigration event with bison much later, so about 45,000 to 21,000 years ago. And so we end up with this really rich family tree of bison that we can re recreate from DNA in fossils themselves. This has rewritten how we do a lot of Pleistocene paleontology. We've done it on mammoths, we've done it on mastodons, we've done it, the saber-toothed cats are still iffy. Uh, but, uh, but bison, it's really helped us understand the morphological record and the fossil record and kind of the big swings in time and space in ways that we weren't able to get at before uh, we had that technique. But some of the first actual fossils that you get south of the ice are way south of the ice. So one, for instance, is Ten Mile Hill in South Carolina. This is uh, a few dozen miles from the Atlantic Ocean. It's not what would you, you would consider kind of native bison habitat. Um, but it's also not a really great bone. It is an ankle bone. Um, <laughs> so it is diagnostic to bison, but it, it's not a horn core, it's not a skull, it's not teeth. These are, those are the things that often tell us what kind of bison it is. But in this case, we can just say it is bison. And it is very well dated, uh, kind of strangely, by associated corals. Um, we have uranium thorium dates on, on associated corals from this site that date it to about 200, 220, 240,000 years ago. Um, then we have this fella from southwestern Missouri, a site called Jones Spring. It looks like a glob of goo. I understand that. So I need to orient you a little bit. Um, so this is the central part of this bison skull. These are the broken off bases of two horn cores. So this is a bison latifrons. And we've got a date on this one of about 160,000 years old. So we have this kind of deeper history south of the ice. We can start using these fossils to calibrate some of our genetic understanding of those family trees. Um, you know, this is this, the, some of the early bison here are these, these big bison latifrons. And bison latifrons, this is a picture of the one down the hall. Uh, you know, it's from Lake Sakakawea here in North Dakota. This is an excellent, you, you guys have an excellent latifrons representative. Thank you uh, for giving this to the world. Um, so th this is, the, this is a, a remnant. So this is a bison priscus moving down south of the ice and evolving in very rapidly into this very large horned, straight horned bison. So these horned cores can be up to six feet long. They're very, very large animals. Uh, they're widely distributed. We have them all the way from you know, Alberta to Florida to California to Mexico uh, and everywhere in between. So even the Great Plains has a fair amount of them. Uh, and we think that they may be some sort of forest dweller. We don't have a lot of data on this. this that's why I have the question mark. But the, these are, um, you know, we don't see them in large herds. Uh, we don't see them, we see them as isolated indiv individuals, and that's usually something that we associate with kind of a more forest uh, behavior. Um, this is just a, 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 um, a, a field shot of one of these bison latifrons being excavated from a, a recent site in, well, sort of recent, in Snowmass, Colorado. So this was a, a high elevation site. There's actually DNA, or at least fragmentary, fragmentary DNA preserved from this 135,000 year old bison latifron skull. So these are part of the story. Um, the other one that we have at it's very similar time, so bison priscus comes down, very rapidly evolves into bison latifrons, and then probably also evolves very quickly into a shorthorn bison form called bison antiquus. Uh, and so you also have a bison antiquus skeleton down the hall, which is really fantastic. Bison antiquus is a bit smaller in terms of its skull, and it definitely has shorter horns. It's a little bit more adaptable uh, to Great Plains environments. We see it as the Great Plains kind of warm and dry at the end of the Pleistocene, and this is one of those bison species that really takes off uh, after the, the rest of the megafauna go extinct. It also happens to be uh, one of those early species where we first have association of human artifacts in bison. So this is just a, a screenshot, it's a classic screenshot of a Folsom Point 
uh, in, uh, um, nestled am among some of the uh, bisonade tequis ribs from the site in Folsom, New Mexico. So that kind of, that, that gets us with uh, kind of bison entering the, the continent. Um, they were here for 150, 200,000 years. Uh, this environment was very variable. So we think of the Ice Age, oh, it must be cold, it must be icy, there must be glaciers everywhere. In reality, that environment changed spatially uh, and it changed through time. So uh, this is just some screenshots or some, some, uh, some, some reconstructions of the Pleistocene in different places. So Texas, you know, we get things like Columbian mammoths and camels. Bison are there, but they're often not a major part of that faunal community. This is La Brea in California where the record is really dominated by saber-toothed cats and direwolves. And if we are going to look at, at the most dominant herbivore, it is bison antiquus. So there are hundreds, if not thousands, of bison antiquus bones from these tar pits in, in California. And then in the Yukon, where we already kind of talked a little bit about this, but you have a much more cold adapted fauna with bighorn sheep, with horses, with uh, woolly mammoths. And bison are also part of that. So bison are kind of this, this commonality across these different ecosystems, across these different Pleistocene ecosystems. And it's really interesting and I want you to kind of put a pin in that because we'll be talking about that as these animals, as we talk about extinctions. So Dr. Flores mentioned, uh, you know, talked a little bit about this Pleistocene extinction. And this is, this, the, what caused this extinction is a million dollar question. Uh, it is something that we've been thinking about for many, many years. Uh, we've been throwing data at it. We've been throwing money at it, uh, you know, for radiocarbon dates, for ancient DNA. We've been trying to tackle it from the side. We've been trying to tackle it front on. And it still kind of eludes uh, simple explanations. Um, if you look at this from a regional perspective, you often get different answers. So it, where I've worked in the Great Plains and in the Midwest, we see um, a crash in megafaunal populations. So these are, these are basically radiocarbon dates and it goes from, it's backwards, sorry. Uh, you know, it basically goes from uh, youngest to oldest across the bottom. And so you kind of see these crashes. These are, these are probability distributions of radiocarbon dates. And so you can kind of see this crash in mammoth dates right at the end of what's called this Younger Dryas. And this is a climate period. And we see a crash in mastodon dates, and we see a crash in ground sloth dates, and horses, and saber-toothed cats. I don't know what's going on there, but uh, <laughs> this, is, this is from somebody else's paper. And then we see a rise in dates that are associated with human habitation. Um, this record, to me, in the places that I've worked, we do not see a lot of uh, humans chasing down, killing, butchering megafauna. So this, this really seems to be more correlated with uh, this climate shift, this ecosystem shift, and this reshuffling of Pleistocene ecosystems at the end of the Ice Age. Um, and this has been part of my research for a while, uh, and we've been looking at this from an ecological point of view in different places and in different times, and so this is kind of a screenshot of a recent paper that we put out, uh, basically kind of trying to boil this down into ecological terms. So, you know, biomass being kind of a, a, a major um, uh, metric for looking at different kinds of ecosystems. And these megafauna, of course, as megafauna, are large parts of this biomass. And, and so you can see this is just the biomass loss between these Pleistocene communities and Holocene communities. And we go from 30% you know, biomass loss to almost 70% biomass loss in the, in the Mississippi River Valley. So this is a restructuring of ecosystems uh, in different places in different times. And so how did bison survive this? What was it about bison that made it so that they are the, the lone survivor of this Pleistocene extinction. So we go from, uh, you know, apologies for the cartoons, but we go from this very rich, very diverse Pleistocene ecosystem where you have mammoths and, and ground sloths and musk oxen and other grazers to one that is fairly depauperate in large animals. We have lots of bison. Uh, and they're adapting to this grassland ecosystem, at least in the Great Plains. Um, they're also... That, that's also changing bison. So we go from 
uh, bison that are on the landscape in twos, threes, maybe a dozen, uh, you know, small herds, to bison on the landscape in herds of hundreds or thousands. And so this has an impact on bison. We know bison are highly social animals. We know that they have this uh, dominant structure that is, is highly evolved and highly complex. And this is the time period where this would have evolved. So we had the larger herds for them to adapt and to, 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 to develop these, these more complex social structures. Um, so what happens? What do bison look like after these extinctions? And immediately after the extinctions, this is the kind of record that we see. We see a lot of bison kill sites and a lot of bison death sites that are just huge numbers of bones, huge numbers of individuals. This one is from northwestern Nebraska, Hudson Meng Bison Bone Bed. It's about 10,000 years old. There's at least 600 bison in this bone bed. We don't know, we call it a bone bed because we don't know whether it was a kill site. We, it's still debated. Uh, it may be a natural death assemblage. You know, these are, these are some of the questions and some of the limitations of the paleontological and the archeological record. But this is the kind of record that we have. It's extremely rich if we can figure out what questions we need to ask of this record about climate, about ecosystem changes, uh, then we have a very rich data set to, that can offer us answers. And so this is also just kind of giving you an idea of where these bison are located. And I want to point out again that during this time period, we have bison in places where you don't normally expect them. Uh, you know, all the way down into southern Arizona and southern California, all the way out in, here into northern Kentucky, which we will revisit momentarily. Um, and so we're, we're, we're dealing with a very flexible animal, uh, an animal that can make its living in, uh, across a number of different environments. Um, what happens in the last 12,000 years to bison? And so this has been a kind of a, a, a common, um, we know that bison got smaller through time. And it used to be that we thought, well, we had bison antiquus and bison latifrons go extinct, and bison, bison, and our modern bison are really the ones that, uh, that pick up the slack. But what we know now is that there's a genetic and a morphological continuity between these populations. So bison antiquus evolves into bison, bison. Uh, it changes its size, it reduces its size by about 20% over the last 12,000 years. So it starts decreasing in size right around this time period where you have those megafaunal extinctions. Uh, over the last 12,000 years, it, it's not very obvious on this graph, but there is quite a bit of up and down on this, depending on climate impacts on grassland ecosystems. If the grasslands are better for bison and more nutritious for bison, then they get bigger. If, they, if you have drought or something where the, the grasses are not as nutritious for bison for long periods of time, then they get smaller. So this is one of those, those, those things that we've thrown a lot of data at the wall and this is what's kind of coming out of it, is, is we are getting this continuity between Pleistocene animals and uh, our modern bison. So the bison that you're seeing today are really just tiny bison antiquus. Uh, and sometimes not even that. So even here, here's a modern bison, and this is a very large bull, and it's the same size as you know, large females in, uh, in these bison antiquus populations. So um, we're, we're dealing with a small, smaller bison, but it's not horribly different, I should say. Um, another thing that we've been working on is this range issue. So bison range, bison geographic ranges are extremely dynamic. And this is something as I move further east, I become more and more aware of. Uh, and so we have, uh, this, is, this is from a paper, like I said, just came out this spring. And read this, this chart here, I'll interpret it a little bit, uh, is the, the, the taller this bar, then the more population growth you have in bison between 18,000 and 17,000 and so on throughout here. So you have a bump right around the time when uh, mammoths and mastodons, ground sloths and the other megafauna go extinct. And then starting about 4,000 years ago, you really see an increase in bison populations. So this is really our, our, our key record for understanding modern bison. This is an animation that basically is showing kind of how this range changes through time. And so the blue is the core of the bison range and, and there are places where bison are increasing. Green is where they're kind of peripheral, but they're still there. And so through time, you can kind of see this range change. And during the Pleistocene, we're seeing a, a lot of expansion in the West and kind of a, a lot of uh, 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 bison into the Eastern US. But then when you get into the Holocene, you start seeing them retracting to their core to about the middle Holocene when it, theoretically it's drier and warmer. 
and then in the last thousand years they start expanding again. So we're getting at some details of the bison range that we were not able to get at before. Um, so ultimately, where are we at with this? Uh, bison, bison, I think we can safely say, is the me most successful large mammal in North America. And it can tell us about these landscapes. It can tell us about these ecosystems. Um, I'm gonna kind of shift gears a little bit, and I've got a few more minutes, shift gears and talk about how they can tell us about these modern ecosystems. And not only about the modern ecosystems as they are today, but how they respond to climates, how they respond to uh, uh, different, different uh, forcers in the past, um, but then also, what is it about fossil bison that we can apply? What are the lessons learned that we can apply to managing bison, modern bison herds? So the question about you know, what makes a bison wild, um, this is approaching that idea, but in a, in a much more nuts and bolts kind of way, I guess. Um, so first, this is something that I've been working on for <laughs> 20 years. It's taken a while. Um, but just a simple question, did bison migrate? Um, this started out as a, a, a question that I had way back when I was in graduate school. It turned into a PhD dissertation. It turned into, uh, you know, years of research. But we actually have some tools that we can address. Did bison, uh, we can address this question, did bison migrate? Um, I went into this question thinking, yes, of course they did. We have all this historic documentation that basically says bison really moves seasonally. Um, and basically, but we also had this new technique, basically looking at chemical tracers or different strontium isotopes in bison teeth and bones that we can then map, map onto a landscape. And so if, in order to do this sort of study, you need two things. You need a, uh, uh, an animal tissue that grows incrementally. And so a bison tooth makes a really good incremental growing tissue. And so we can take tiny little samples down this tooth of bison, and we get about a year and a half of snapshots of that animal's life, chemical snapshots of that animal's life. And if we look at the strontium isotopes in that enamel, we can actually map it onto known distributions of strontium isotopes on the surface. And so in so doing, we can reconstruct bison migrations. Um, and so this is something um, you know, we've looked at it in a number of different sites, uh, some Great Plains sites, some in the eastern U.S., some other researchers have looked at, at uh, um, La Brea samples, and what we've found is that there is a lot of evidence for bison moving fairly locally, uh, you know, moving from an upland to a lowland within a single river system. Um, there's some evidence for uh, individual dispersal behavior, so bull, move, bull animals moving from a natal herd in one area and then moving, you know, 50 kilometers away or 100 kilometers away to a new herd or to a new range. And so we're seeing some of these real biological events in individual animals, which is really, really fun. One thing we aren't seeing is seasonal migrations. Uh, and so this was kind of a surprise. Um, and and uh, so we are not seeing seasonal migration, at least thus far, in some of the samples that we've looked at. And so we're not seeing large movements uh, of animals that are going from, say, you know, eastern Nebraska to western Nebraska or from uh, the Missouri River out into Wyoming. You know, so we're not seeing those kind of large-scale movements. Um, and we keep looking for them. We keep thinking, okay, maybe it, maybe it has something to do with some variable that we haven't analyzed yet. And so we've looked at a lot of different things. It, and we see basically local movement uh, regardless of species identity, whether it's a bison antiquus or bison bison. We see local movement regardless of time period. Uh, we've looked at um, late Pleistocene bison. We've looked at bison from the 1815s, 1820s and everything in between. And the general pattern is that they are local movers. Over the course of a couple of years, a, a herd may drift, but it's not doing kind of directed seasonal movement. And this is something that the fossil record can really kind of give you a different kind of perspective on this. Um, why we see this in the, in the historical record and we don't see it in the archeological or in the paleontological record, I'm not sure. That's still one of those open questions and it's one of the reasons why I'm here today so I can talk to historians, so I can talk to, uh, and we can, we can talk about oral histories uh, and things like that. Another thing we've been doing is going places where bison, we don't expect to find bison. 
Um, and one of those places is at high elevations. So down here in the Missouri River Valley, you know, we're not normally thinking about bison and mountains, but if you go up to the Yellowstone National Park, we have some bison remains that are found at very, very high elevations, 10,000 feet and above. So this is a bison mandible that was found up by this melting ice patch. So this mandible is, was locked away in ice for the last 2,000 years. Uh, modern bison, the modern herds in Yellowstone do not get this high. Uh, so they max out about 6,000 feet in elevation. Uh, so these are animals that are ranging a, uh, along high exposed ridge lines that modern animals don't go on. So one of the questions we had were similar methods uh, to what I was always talking about. You know, we have teeth. Uh, we can look at some of the data on this. We can look at how these animals are, are navigating this landscape. And I don't expect you to look at in detail at all of this, but it's to give you an idea. There's, there is a message here. Um, this is research by one of my recent graduate students, Darian Bouvier. Uh, and so we've looked at some of the strontium isotopes. Basically, we could, these, these uh, orange records are records where the bison is moving more than 10 kilometers. Uh, throughout the length of that tooth, so about a year and a half of that animal's life. Uh, so these are records that, that they're moving a little bit more up that high. But one of the things that Darian really looked at is we have excellent preservation uh, at these high elevations because it's cold, so things preserve a little bit better. We actually have preserved horn sheaths, not horn cores, not bones, not teeth, but horn sheaths. This is the sheath that goes over a bison horn core. Um, they're not made of bone, they're made of keratin, like your fingernails. And that keratin forms in layers. And so what Darian did was uh, analyze each one of these layers in a number of these different horn sheaths for different chemicals that reflect bison behavior. So here's, this, and these are a lot of squiggly lines. Um, I tell my students that squiggly lines are good because it gives you something to interpret. Uh, <laughs> but we're looking at the, the, the range of, of these chemicals in these isotopes in different uh, different isotopic systems throughout the thickness of these horn cores. And each squiggly line is a different bison. So we actually have about 11 of these bison. And oxygen isotopes basically are a seasonal signal, and so it goes up and down depending on whether you're summer or winter. Nitrogen is basically tracking whether you're in a low valley or whether you're high up on one of these ridges. And then carbon is, is tracking um, you know, the, the, whether you're eating C4 grasses, like summer blooming grasses, or whether you're eating C3, cool season grasses, and, uh, and woody plants. And you can see the, the take home message here, I don't expect you to tease this apart because I'm still teasing this apart, but the take home message is that bison are extremely variable at an individual level. Um, you know, here, just this, taking this, this, this kind of mobility proxy of nitrogen, down here, this is, this is basically your uh, high elevation signal, and we have some animals that are basically staying up on those high ridges all the time. You know, winter, exposed, cold, miserable, those animals are up there. We have some animals that are down in the valleys all the time, and they're not moving up and, and back and forth. But we have some animals that are going back and forth seasonally. So we're getting at some of the individual life histories of these different animals and trying to understand and getting at uh, really the variability and the flexibility that bison have in, in how they manage a landscape. Um, kind of an extension of this is looking at bison along this eastern edge of their range. So we normally, we know a lot about bison in the Great Plains. Uh, we know much less about bison as you get further east. And so one of the places that we, we've been doing a lot of work is in Illinois. This is a diorama from the Illinois State Museum. And then also in northern Kentucky, this is one of my current students, Maggie Stevenson, doing an outreach with uh, staff at Big Bone Lake State Park. Um, and then we also have uh, threw this in because we just got radiocarbon dates back on this. This is a bison tooth from our collection from a cave in eastern Tennessee. Radiocarbon date comes back about 150 years ago, so it's a very modern bison. It's very real. They're, they're present on the landscape out east. This is, this is in the southern Appalachian Mountains, so it's not a normal place where you would think of, of finding bison. Um, but I'm going to talk first about the tall grass prairies real briefly. Uh, for many years, I was a curator at the Illinois State Museum, and it, I happened to be there when the Nature Conservancy and the Forest Service were reintroducing bison to a lot of tall, preserved tall grass prairies. And so there was a big debate on whether, uh, on how to do these introductions. What are the herd sizes? What are they supposed to be eating? Are they impacting uh, endangered plants and that sort of thing? So there, there was a lot of this conversation. Uh, and the fossil record really can add to this. Um, these are the, the fossil record of 
Illinois, Iowa, Ohio, and places further east basically are indicating that these are smaller herds than we have out west. Uh, they're, they're, they don't have these elaborate dominance hierarchies probably. Uh, a lot of times their, their, their diets are much broader, um, and so sometimes they're even hanging out in enclosed canopy forests and that sort of thing. So basically the take home message of some of these studies has been that uh, bison in the Midwest and in the tall grass prairies are not the same as bison in say Yellowstone National Park or in North Dakota. Uh, and so we really need to take into consideration and be cognizant of some of these geographical dis differences and ecological differences. Uh, this is just a gratuitous shot of what some of these look like. I told you you'd see lots of bison metapodials. Uh, this is a tray of bison metapodials from a late Holocene site. So it's about a 20, 20, 2000 year old site from Northern Illinois, just south of Chicago by a little town called Manuka, uh, which has, uh, the, the early strata, this never happens except in Illinois. Uh, the early strata are filled with mammoths and mastodons and uh, giant moose. And then on the top, the cream of the, uh, the, the, the sediments is basically this late Holocene bison assemblage. And so we can learn about Illinois bison, we can learn about Midwestern bison based on these fossils. These particular fossils, like I said, they're about 2,000 years old. Uh, these are animals that are occupying the uplands eating big blue stream prairie. Uh, it's a very, very standard uh, C4 diet, um, but they're probably smaller herds. Uh, and, and so there, there's some, some really kind of regional specifics that uh, the fossil record can give us. This is just some other th work that's uh, done specifically in Ohio. Ohio is not where you normally think of having bison, especially in the bottom of the Ohio River Valley. And this was kind of an aha moment for me after having spent you know, years of my life looking at Great Plains bison assemblages. I ran across a box of these teeth from Big Bone Lake, Kentucky in the University of Nebraska State Museum and went, what? Um, and so we were doing some of the similar chemical analyses of their teeth. And so you can see we have some changes. Uh, this, this is uh, you know, length from the, the bottom of the tooth essentially down here on this axis. And you can see that we have those snapshots change in terms of their carbon isotopes or that diet proxy. One of the interesting things about this is that these are really negative. So that we don't have much in the way of grass that's contributing to these bison diets. These, and, and that kind of got us thinking. And we started looking at the morphology of the teeth themselves. So this is one of these teeth from Big Bone Lake, Kentucky. This is one from uh, a site in Western Kansas. They're the same age. They're both wearing, and this one from Western Kansas, you can see has worn completely flat. This one over here still has this very cuspy wear. And that's a, that's a sign that this animal uh, has been eating something very different from this animal in the Western Plains. This animal is eating shrubs, woody vegetation, leafy greens. It's not eating grass, because if it were eating grass, that tooth would wear flat. So we're dealing with an animal that is, is basically occupying a very different niche than uh, bison in the Great Plains. And so this is underscoring, there, there is a message here, uh, this is underscoring that bison are extremely flexible, extremely adaptable, and there's a reason why they are widely distributed in space and time. Uh, we're also able to look at, there's a lot of skulls from this particular site, and we can compare them to uh, sites out on the Great Plains that are of a similar age, even one over here in Oregon. Uh, and basically we saw that this bison is not any different than morphologically speaking, in terms of its size, its shape, its horn cores, it's not any different from any of these contemporary bison in the Great Plains. So we, there, there is this idea that you might have a forest bison or a wood bison uh, in more forested areas in the eastern US. And this is basically saying, at least at the, the resolution of the paleontological record, um, these look the same. And this makes sense with some of our recent DNA work, uh, where we have uh, basically a, a core population of bison in the plains that periodically get really, uh, really happy and kind of move east or move west, and they expand uh, and occupy new niches in the eastern U.S. and the western U.S. So overall, what we can say, and this is, I have to put this up here, this is actually a, a sketch that my daughter did for me for Father's Day, uh, knowing that I really like bison, so she'll be happy that I used it. But, um, you know, what can this fossil record, what can this, this uh, record of bison bones tell us about modern bison and, and kind of what is a wild bison? 
Um, basically, it's a record of lots of variability. Uh, I, I like to joke that you know a lot of my work is I kind of operate under this gambler's fallacy. I'm like, well, you know, if I just get one more sample or if I look at one more skull, then all of it will make sense. And then you look at one more skull and none of it makes sense. It just gets more complex. We still have lots of questions. Uh, but there are some kind of take home messages. Uh, bison are flexible, very adaptable feeders. Uh, this is one, probably one of the reasons why they survived those Pleistocene extinctions. They were able to adapt when other megafaunal species were not. Uh, they have local movements, so they're probably not moving seasonally very far. Um, they're able to adjust to a surprising variety of ecological niches. Um, you know, they even we see this with modern bison, where we're introducing them to places where they they really weren't at any time in the past. I think about like Santa Rosa Island uh, in the Channel Islands off the coast of California, that had a very uh, healthy bison herd up until fairly recently. And then we also are looking at basically the same species, same morphology across their range. We're looking at a single metapopulation that changes in space and time. And it's, it, from an ecological perspective, it's really, really interesting. So I'm going to stop there. I don't know that I have a lot of time for questions. This has been a long, uh, this has been a really good excuse for me to synthesize a lot of the, the smaller projects that I've been involved in through the years. And there's a lot of uh, collaborators and, and co-authors that, that have helped us out. So thank you. <laughs>